The National Action Network's annual conference has been going on all week, and we have been right in the middle of the action. Both Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, they spoke at Al Sharpton's annual event, and so did lots of other big names. Well, Dominic Carter, as you've been seeing on this program, he was there, and he spoke with a lot of the power brokers, including catching up with feminist icon and activist Gloria Steinem, and he got her take on the presidential race. We are only now four days from the election, the primary on both sides here in New York. What do you make of the contest? It's a very, very unusual year, as we all know. Uh, we have Trump, a candidate who uh, thrives on conflict and hate and presents himself as a successful businessman. He's a successful con man, but not a businessman. And I can only hope that this disaster will cause the Republican Party to come back to its centrist self and not be the very, very right-wing divisive party that it has been. On the Democratic side, we have two good people with good hearts. <laughs> we have, you know, this, somebody who's defining the issues, which is Senator Sanders, and is very good at it. And uh, we have somebody who can uh, solve the issues and is very good at it, which is Hillary Clinton. Why is this important to you? It, it's important to be here because this is where change begins. This is about organizing, it's about delineating and making visible the issues, making the invisible visible. Uh, it's about understanding that we are all linked, we are not ranked. You know, Dom, it's interesting. Um, Gloria Steinem, uh, usually measured in what she says, after the, uh, obviously known for activism and fighting for women's equality, but she, along with Madeleine Albright, made news when mm -hmm. she said, you know, basically, Adel Albright said there's a place in hell for women who didn't support mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Steinem wasn't that much farther saying mm -hmm. the women were out there looking for guys and stuff mm -hmm. like that. You remember? Mm -hmm. It's funny. Nobody would have imagined, don't you think, six, nine months ago that icons, female powerful, have been put somewhat to the side because of both the imagery and the messaging, they're mad. And Hillary knows wisely, I think, can't get these people in front of cameras too much because it's gonna only feed into Bernie Sanders uh, supporters and their anger towards establishment. For now, for now. For now. Let's see what happens uh, in a few months if Hillary Clinton is the nominee. What I can say about uh, Steinem as an icon, when she was walking past us, and we, uh, we of course grabbed her, yeah. And she didn't set any limitations, Richard. Not she like Trump's said, campaign manager. You no, just no, no, yes, no. Ahead, it yeah, wasn't yeah, one of those. Just clear that, yeah. <laughs> but we, you know, can you yeah. please? She didn't say, "Don't ask me this, don't ask me that." No, yeah. she said, "Let's roll." Yeah. And and we did the interview. You know, so so I give her a lot of and credit for that. She's a giant for folks. Uh, who oh, don't you should know have seen her in the room. In yeah. a room with predominantly African American people, and she was a complete rock star. Yep. Well. A name um, that certainly doesn't um, need an introduction within Democratic circles, um, Robert F. Kennedy. Well, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is also a high-profile figure in his own right, particularly on environmental affairs, and he also spoke to Dom. Four out of every five toxic waste dumps in America is in a black neighborhood. The highest concentration of toxic waste dumps in America is the south side of Chicago. The most contaminated zip code in California is East L.A. That's because, a, you know, wherever you see environmental injury, you'll also see a subversion of democracy, a, 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 a erosion or the destruction of local power, the capture of the agencies that are supposed to protect us. So you're outraged at what's going on in Flint, Michigan? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're working very heavily in Flint. But Flint's not unique. This happens all over the United States. In fact, I mean, look here in New York and the 79th Street sewage treatment plant, the sewage treatment plant up in Harlem was supposed to have been built in 79th Street. But the people who lived in 79th Street didn't want them there, so they kicked it up to Harlem. So any place where you see uh, where there's obnoxious facilities that people don't want in their neighborhoods, they end up in a poor neighborhood or they end up in a neighborhood where there's people of color. And you know, Don, we saw in the news just this week, um, all of a sudden water testing is showing huge 
um, levels of lead all over the place. I mean, in New Jersey, you don't have to go to Michigan to find this story. You get the sense this is going to become a bigger and bigger story by the end of the year. The abdication of government looking out for not just um, certain citizens, but primarily citizens in the poorer communities, as we said. Nobody in Park Avenue would have put up with uh, for a year getting brown water just because they were trying to save a buck. Let me be very clear about this, Richard. Um, of course, we know about Mr. Kennedy, but you know his big thing is the environment. Okay, that man scared me last night with some of the information. I mean, really scared yeah. me. And when he was telling me the story as we just aired about the environmental plant, well, uh, you know, the Harlem, and because mm -hmm. I passed by it every day, it was supposed to go on 79th Street, but the community residents said no, 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 and then it ended up in Harlem. He really, I, we, we couldn't air the entire interview, um, but he talked about uh, Chicago, he talked about Los Angeles, same scenario yep. as far as the environment. Uh, Dom also uh, caught up with. Um, um, Mark Morial, and um, he obviously, with the Urban League, the president there, about an issue that's really, in many ways, decided who, in all likelihood, the next Democratic nominee is going to be. That's the black vote, and why the black vote is broken for Hillary Clinton. The Urban League does not do political endorsements, but as someone that is an expert on the African American community, can you explain to us why it appears Bernie Sanders is not resonating with the African-American community? Well, Bernie Sanders started out, uh, every race is about choices. And Bernie Sanders started out uh, with African-American voters being an unknown quantity, uh, a new personality, a new uh, person. So it's, it's uh, so easy to suggest that people might like some of what he's saying but still not be willing to support him or vote for him because he's a brand new quantity. And uh, African-American voters many times uh, base their vote on trust, on relationships, not just on promises or messages. And so in this race, he happens to be uh, uh, versus a, a Hillary Clinton who's got a long-standing relationship a long-standing track record, and albeit, as you've seen from the debate, not necessarily perfect in every respect, but it's a long-standing relationship. I think African-American voters are, are certainly uh, voters that stick with people for a long time. They're loyal voters. So Sanders is going to resonate. He's come up with a message that appeals, uh, I think, to voters, but he doesn't have the long-standing history. You know, it's one thing to say 50 years ago, I marched with Dr. King. Thousands marched with Dr. King, and I would respect anyone who was there. But there's been this long period of time, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, uh, and I think Bernie Sanders, uh, being a new quantity, hasn't had the working relationship uh, with African-American leadership over that, that the period of the last 25 to 30 years. You know, one thing I took from that, and it seems obvious until you hear it, but Hillary Clinton's not a perfect candidate. There are very few, if any. But nobody can take away from the Clintons. And it was such, if we think about it, an anomaly what happened eight years ago because it was Barack Obama. But they cultivate that, that Clinton Rolodex, right? That they keep building it and they maintain it. And they knew before this thing started, it would have taken a lot for the Sharptons of the world, the Morials of the world, to say we're going to go in another direction. I mean, there's only one Barack Obama that we've seen in our lifetimes, okay? Mm -hmm. So people, I think, misjudge how far that goes. And I think he was right. Very few constituencies have more loyalty from a voting standpoint than the black community. No doubt about it. In communities where it's more of a mainstream audience, Mr. Sanders has done much better. He's on a winning streak as of late, but he's run into a brick wall. There's no way for him to get around the black vote. And the black vote, okay, the Urban League, they do not make endorsements. Sharpton has not made an endorsement. Interview them, read between the lines. That interview we just aired, we're with Hillary. Yep. Um, you know, what I also think I interesting is if it comes down, and I think it does, the black vote in the end of the day is what carried Hillary Clinton. And imagine you and me having that conversation eight years ago. Um, we leave Charlotte, right? And 
and we're saying eight years from now, Dom, you know what? Hillary's going to be uh, the nominee for the Democrats, and she's going to have the blacks to thank for it. We'd both have laughed at each other. Mm -hmm, I'm laughing now. But that's what happened. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. She needs the assuming black vote. Assuming New York vote. goes the way it is. I want you guys all laugh at me on Wednesday, but assuming Richard, it goes. Richard, yeah. she needs the black vote so badly, she's now telling the white community to feel sympathy for what African Americans have gone through. She has become almost, and, and I'm not saying this in a jokey way because it's true, she has become an advocate, an activist, against yeah. alleged police brutality. Um, Dom had a lot more conversations next week, a fascinating one um, with, uh, with Newfeld, who runs the Innocence Project, a great group. I really wanted to give it more time, so we're going to play that for you next week as well as other conversations. All right, stay with us, everybody. we got Valley Headlines straight ahead.